the best way to get started is by way of introduction. Um, and I, I was told incorrectly, apparently, is that everybody here is a farmer. And I found out right now that's not true. <laughs> and I also was assured that uh, everybody who's here, that nobody from this group would be attending my lecture, which is on Saturday evening. If if you've listened to this one, you can skip the lecture uh, because they're, they're pretty similar. So I designed this one to be kind of similar to what I'm going to be presenting as the last lecture on Saturday. So uh, as, as you like. So I'll tell you, maybe I'll start by telling you a little bit about myself. And then I'd like to hear from you so I know who I'm talking to. Because now I know that you're not all farmers. <laughs> OK. So um, I. Uh, in my education from the University of Pennsylvania was in the area of uh, biomedical engineering, which is a sort of combination of engineering and biology and, and medicine. For 20 or 25 years, I studied the mechanism, the molecular mechanism of muscle contraction, how the proteins inside the muscle uh, um, interact to produce force and, and motion. And one day, it came to me that the people who are interested in finding out how muscles contract are ignoring the, the most prevalent molecule in the muscle, and that is water. So muscles are two-thirds water. And it seems that to border on arrogance to think that the most prevalent molecule inside the muscle doesn't do anything. It just sits there as the background carrier uh, um, of the more important molecules. So I began to get interested in, uh, in, in water. And the, it's been a passion for me. And we discovered something that something unusual. You, you all um, have learned that water has three phases, right? A solid, a liquid, and a vapor. And we discovered a fourth phase. It's you might say it's not exactly a discovery because people before us had been thinking that in biology there's a different kind of water, that the molecules are somehow organized uh, um, in, in, in some like liquid crystalline array of some sort. And this idea is an old idea, but, but essentially nobody in the scientific field uh, has been taking, taking it seriously. And so I'm going to tell you the story uh, about that and the implications. And there'll be some implications uh, for us, for, for humans and animals, and other implications for plants. So this is not only about plants. Um, I come from the University of Washington. The program says Washington University. That's in St. Louis. I'm from Seattle. It's a different university. In fact, there is University of Washington, Washington University, Central Washington University, George Washington University. Washington is a very popular name in, in the US. So I'm the one from, from Seattle. OK, so let, let me get started. Um, the topic is obviously water. Um, and you know when, when you think about water, um, you, m most people think that everything there is to know about water must already be known. <laughs> you think not. <laughs> By the way, feel free, feel free to interrupt and ask questions if you like. This is very informal. Uh, it's more fun that way. Um, and and uh, so what I, the first few slides are, are designed to demonstrate to you that you really don't know as much as you think you know about water, because I'm going to show you uh, a few phenomena that I believe you won't be able to explain. Uh, if you could explain it, then you know more about water than I think. So, so here's the first one. Uh, so here's a cloud, and the water is beneath. And the water is evaporating uh, from everywhere. Uh, the water is not evaporating from the region, only the region beneath the cloud. And so the question is, how come you have a cloud here, but you don't have a cloud here? Or, or here? How is that possible? Is it somehow that this, this cloud is attracting the evaporated water to itself, or what? Uh, I, I think you don't know the answer to it unless you've seen some of my uh, stuff before, because it's really not obvious. And if you don't know the answer, then you don't know all there is to know about water. Um, so here's another one. Uh, in, in this case, we're dropping water on water. So uh, this micro pipette is filled with water, and it's falling on a surface of water. And you can see, you expect the two to coalesce instantly, but they don't. 
the water droplets float on water. And if you look out when it's raining, look at puddles, you can actually see this phenomenon uh, itself. But we're taught that water combining with water, that the two will coalesce instantly, but you can see that that's not always the case. Do you know why? It's not obvious, okay, but it should be obvious later if you don't fall asleep, okay. So here's another uh, instance. Uh, here are two beakers that are filled with water almost to the brim, and you can see that the two rims are touching one another. Then you put one electrode in here, one electrode in here, and you impose a high voltage, and look at what happens. So you get a bridge between the two, and if you move one beaker away from the other beaker, then what happens is that the bridge is sustained. And it's sustained for a distance of up to three or four centimeters separation, and it's sustained essentially indefinitely. <laughs> I can see a laugh over there. So, yeah, I mean, this is not what you expect from water, right? So. So there's something that you don't, actually, almost nobody understands what's going on here. We have some idea, but, um, but you don't understand. And if you don't understand it, then you don't know all there is to know about water, okay? And uh, an another example, uh, this is a, a magnet. The, the blue gadget in, in, uh, in the back is a, a strong uh, superconducting magnet. And in front of the magnet is a trough filled with water. The water is red, some red dye is added. It has no significance whatsoever except to add some drama to, uh, to the, the picture. So this trough of water, um, when, the, when the magnet is turned on, the water splits so that Moses could walk across the Red Sea. <laughs> um, again, <laughs> it's, it's not so clear what the mechanism is, and I, I bet that you don't understand it because almost nobody understands it. But the point is that it's real, uh, and it can happen. I saw a demonstration myself. So main point of all of these is that there, there's a lot of stuff about water that we don't understand, although we think that since water has been studied for hundreds of years by scientists, uh, you know, it's one of the most abundant substances, not only on the face of, of the earth, but almost everywhere that you look, you find, you find water, and yet we really don't understand water. There are reasons for it. If we have a discussion later, I can tell, tell you about two debacles that took place in the field of water, which has made scientists scared to enter into the domain of water because of what happened to various scientists who had been studying water. Well, I, I, I got interested in this uh, from a, a guy named Gilbert Ling. Probably most of you have never heard of him. Uh, Gilbert is a uh, former, he's a Chinese American. He's now 100 years old, um, living in a nursing home. And he came, it was the first contingent of people to come to the US for postdoctoral studies from China. And he was selected among all of China. There were three people who came. He was one of the three. Another guy went on to win the Nobel Prize in physics. So these were, you know, really high-level guys, and they thought he was, he was the smartest. Um, the guy who won the Nobel Prize, by the way, is more famous in China. He's still around. More famous in China, not for his scientific uh, achievements, but because when he was about 90 years old, he married his translator, who was 32 at the time. Uh, and there, there were rumors that she was pregnant, I, I, I'm not sure. Anyway, uh, so that's Gilbert Ling. And Gilbert, Gilbert um, had been talking for years about water in biology, water inside the cell. And he said in his now, I think, six books or seven books, he said that the water inside the cell is not like water in the glass. So here, the molecules are arranged randomly, and they're flipping around at a um, um, uh, huge number of times, even per nanosecond. Um, and and um, uh, he said that it's different inside the cell. He said the water molecules are like dipoles with plus and minus at one end, and they kind of line up the way you line up dominoes. His work was very controversial. Uh, many people refused even to pay attention to it. Um, I, I thought there was something to it. I showed one of his books to my students and postdocs, and every one of them said, you know, this guy is really on to something important. And so 
my goal at the time was to make his ideas available uh, to to the scientific community because it's a real it's been a real challenge to read what Gilbert Ling has to say his writing style is fine you know he can understand what he's writing but other people have more difficulty understand what, what understanding what he's writing and so I endeavored to to uh, bring his ideas to the public well m mostly to to scientists but non scientists as well in this book which was published in in 2001 and the the book was controversial some people loved it other people hated it but um, I'm told that discerning people really like the book quite a lot <laughs> and uh, and here's the evidence for it <laughs> as you can see it's a, a popular among some groups uh, so one of the one of the main features, as I pointed out, is that the the water molecules, uh, which are dipoles, have a tendency to line up next to surfaces inside the cell. So most of the surfaces inside the cell are protein surfaces, also nucleic acids, but about 70% of the solids are proteins, and and the proteins usually have charges on on their outer surfaces. And so the idea was that, for example, uh, this molecule right here um, would be attracted, the negative part, the positive part of the molecule is attracted to the negative charge and so on. And so you get molecules that lined up in various uh, layers, which Gilbert Ling likes to call multi-layers. And his idea was that this force was strong enough that it could beat the tendency, the natural tendency to disorder, which is caused by thermal or Brownian motion. So when you go far enough away from the surface, the molecules are no longer strictly uh, aligned with one another, they tend to be randomized. And physical chemists in general understand that one or two uh, molecular layers of water uh, might be organized. And Gilbert was suggesting there could be up to dozens, uh, maybe even hundreds of layers that are, are organized. And as I said, this is not popular. But we, uh, with the publication of that book, we became seriously interested in, in this kind of water to, to check experimentally to see if we not only, not only could find it, but also understand more about the character of that water. Um, and, and we did, and what I'm going to tell you uh, 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 is, is some of what we've learned. Well, one of the central features of this kind of water is it's just like a, a crystal, because in crystals the molecules are organized, and, and in, in terms of crystals, crystals tend to exclude solutes and particles. It's like you know, when ice forms, uh, uh, the ice is a, a pure crystal. It pushes out all the impurities that are in the ice. It is the same, the same principle. So we were looking for an experimental system uh, where uh, solutes and particles were excluded. And the idea would be that potentially, at least, if we could see some sort of region where particles were excluded, there's a possibility that that region might contain this kind of ordered water. And we were lucky enough to find it. Uh, it's a very simple system. Uh, this, is, this is a chamber that you see here. And in the chamber, we put a gel, um, you know, almost like, uh, like the gel, gel that you might have uh, with your meal or for dessert, if you're unlucky enough. Uh, and and we put, next to the gel, we poured water containing particles. The particles were microspheres, maybe some of you have the tiny spheres, one micrometer or so in, in diameter, and they're suspended in the water. Uh, and, and what we found when we looked at that was that there was a region right next to the gel, the surface of the gel, that had no microspheres, so the microspheres were excluded. And because they're excluded, we thought one possibility, it certainly doesn't prove it, but one possibility is that this region here contains that kind of ordered or structured water that Gilbert Ling had, had identified. And it was actually more striking than what, what you see here. If you look at the video of it, 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 it looks as though something is growing at that interface and pushing the particles away. You see, and after a while, this is five or ten minutes or so, uh, it stops, and there, there is a, a region here. In this case, it's about 50 micrometers. So how big is 50 micrometers? It's, um, it's like half the thickness of one of your hairs. Not mine, because I don't have many. <laughs> but um, 
um, that that's the size. So this is by by molecular standards, this is monumental. This is really large, and so obvious. Please, yeah. Is, is, it, is the border simply the edge of the gel, or is there something separate? No, it's just the edge. And I'm sorry, it's the optics of the microscope. Uh, see, the the gel interface is straight, but if it's tilted slightly, then you'll get a um, kind of expanded shadow region that that looks black here. Sorry, my yeah here. Okay, so. We were very happy to find this because this gave us a sense that maybe, maybe we have a region of ordered water. And if so, this region would be huge, even, even much larger than Gilbert Ling had, had suggested. So we got excited about it. I got excited. Uh, someone said, you know, you found something pretty interesting. You got to give it a name. <laughs> so what do you call it? Well, my friend from Australia had a great suggestion. He said, because it excludes, why don't you call it exclusion zone, right? And if you call it exclusion zone, uh, it's EZ for short, which is easy to remember. But the problem is it doesn't work in Europe because it's EZ instead of EZ. So it loses the, it loses the advantage. Anyway, this is, we, we call this exclusion zone. And you'll see in a moment the evidence for water as some kind of ordered water inside. We call it EZ water, exclusion zone water, fourth phase water. Here's another example. Um, this is a, a piece of nafion. So what's, what's nafion? Nafion is a polymer which has a lot of charge groups. The backbone is just like Teflon, uh, but it has sulfonate groups which confer a negative charge. So it comes in sheets, and the sheets are a little bit expensive, but it it really makes it easy for us because we can take a sheet um, and cut it in any, any way we like. So here you see an arrowhead uh, shape. So you, you can take any shape you'd like. We plunk it down into the chamber and we pour um, water containing microspheres. And you can already see that this zone is, is getting formed. And, um, and you can see it expand over time. This is sped up. It takes about five minutes or so. Uh, to reach the full value. And here, it's about, I'm sorry, the scale is not on here. It's about 500 micrometers, half a millimeter. So half a millimeter is extraordinary. If, if this involves water, it means, it means that the water molecules have the capacity to organize themselves over a span of half, half, a, half a millimeter that's macroscopic. You don't even need a microscope to see this. This one is taken through the microscope, but you can see it with your naked eye. Well, since we discovered this, a lot of people have, have um, tried to reproduce it. And this list was constructed about six or seven years ago. Uh, by now, many people have identified it. In fact, we were really embarrassed because one of my students uh, one evening sent me an email. He said, check, check this out very soon. It turned out that a, a, group, um, pub, a, a group of physiologists were investigating the lens of the eye, natural lens and also um, 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 artificial uh, lenses. And they reported almost exactly the same as what we saw in 1970 in the Journal of Physiology, London. So, so we were scooped, but it, it doesn't matter. I mean, there's no question about the existence of this zone. The question is, what does it mean? And I'll get to that in a moment. Um, because I know all of you are, are interested um, uh, specifically in agriculture, this uh, is an image that was sent to me. Some of you may know Ma the late Martin Canny, who, who um, um, was in, involved with vessels, uh, plant vessels, and this is xylem from. I'm sorry, I don't, I don't know which plant it is, but he got interested in um, in the idea of easy water, and he sent me this slide. And what he did was he put some microspheres uh, into the vessel, and this is an electron micrograph that was taken, and he showed that around the edges uh, where we we would expect from the hydrophilic surfaces there might be an exclusion zone. There was. Um, uh, excluding these microspheres in the same way that I showed uh, for those other instances. So, so what, I'm, what I'm telling you, what I'm going to tell you applies also in agriculture uh, and maybe really important for agriculture. So what I, what I want to, to, to do to focus on is tell you um, what all this is, is about and especially the evidence. So I want to answer five questions. 
the first, is this exclusion uh, phenomenon general, or just those few slides that I showed? Can you find it all around, or have I just been selective? The second, does it really arise from the ordering of water molecules? Because I haven't convinced you of that at all. I just showed you some region, and you don't know uh, what's causing it. Uh, and the third, um, can the water ordering explain those first few slides that I showed? Uh, which you, I believe, were not able to interpret. Um, um, and, and then, in order to create order, you need energy. So this is a fundamental principle of thermodynamics. Uh, um, if you go from chaos to order, it takes energy. It's kind of like um, cleaning your room. You know, your room gets messy over time. It requires essentially no energy to get it messy, but if you want to straighten it up, you really have to take the time and the effort and the energy to get it straightened. So it's a kind of nice analogy. And, and the principle, principle applies, so you need energy to create order. And if this is ordered water, where on earth does the energy come from? You know, you can't plug it into 220 volts or something like that, so, and you can't put gasoline uh, to, so, okay, and I'll get to that later. Um, and might these findings apply broadly? And of course, uh, your interest is agriculture, and I'll, I'll deal with that uh, to some extent uh, later. So the first question is generality. And uh, um, I can show you many slides showing, but let me summarize, because, because uh, there's a lot of interesting stuff to come, and I don't, I don't want to use all my time. And so we've tried surfaces of many, many different substances. We've tried uh, gels. Uh, um, we must have tried 15 to 20 different gels, and we find this exclusion zone next to every one. Uh, Water-based gels, you know, like the f gels that you might eat, uh, for example, like other gels inside your body. We tried various polymers, and um, if the polymer is hydrophilic, you know, water loving. That means, that means uh, if if you if you were to pour the water onto the surface and the water spreads out, instead of beating up like it does on Teflon, then uh, not every case, but um, many, if not most cases, we can find this uh, exclusion zone. We tried biological surfaces of various sorts, like plant roots, uh, uh, mussels, because we we have experience uh, with, with, with muscles, uh, collagen, um, and such, and, and uh, cellulose, and we find it consistently next to these surfaces. And an interesting one is uh, monolayers, that is single molecular layers on gold. This is a standard preparation among uh, materials uh, uh, scientists, and so you take a monolayer, one, one molecular layer on, on a surface that's functionalized in various ways, and you can see this easy developing next to single molecular layers, which suggests that that layer acts as a template, and next to the template you uh, build this kind of water. Then next question is, well, okay, so we, we know what surfaces generate EZs, and there are many of them, so what solutes are excluded? We tried many solutes. Um, uh, we tried from big ones to small ones. And the big ones are giant particles, and they're easy. They're always, no, essentially, whatever particles you put into water are excluded. And we tried getting smaller in scale, getting down, for example, to, to um, um, <coughs> proteins um, and large molecules excluded, bacteria, viruses, and various chemicals down to molecular weight 100 or so and, and even lower. And you can tell because um, in some cases we use dyes and you can see where the dye is and where the dye isn't. And so if the exclusion zone contains no dye but everything else contains dye, then you know the dye hasn't gone in. And typically these are molecular weights around 100 or so. And we think salt molecules are excluded too, but they're more difficult to, uh, to test. So, uh, I'll, and I'll show you one slide showing uh, exclusion. So in terms of generality, um, uh, many hydrophilic surfaces, not all, but many of them, uh, generate exclusion zones and many solutes are excluded. So that's question one. Okay. Question two um, is, is the zone really different from, uh, is the water really different from what we call bulk water, ordinary water, which sits in, in this glass here? 
And um, there's a long list. I'm going to list eight different uh, experimental observations. By now, there are more than a dozen, but uh, I, I don't want to bore you. And I won't go through the details, because a lot of this has been published. And uh, anybody who wants to check it can look. And I want to reserve enough time for the more interesting stuff, which comes afterward. I, I just want to, to, to convey to you the evidence for what, what we're claiming. OK. And, uh, um, and so the first one is that the molecules of easy water are more constrained than ordinary molecules. They don't move around as much. And we use nuclear magnetic resonance to, uh, to demonstrate that. And as I said, most of this stuff is published. Uh, the molecules are more stable. Again, they don't move around. And we use infrared radiation to determine that. So if you look at the EZ, you see less infrared radiation than the water next to it. And you see less because the molecules are not moving. And in order to get infrared radiation, you need molecules and the charges within those molecules moving around. So it's, you might say it's cooler. Um, and that also has implications um, um, for agriculture. It has negative charge. This, is, this was a real surprise for us. Um, I'll show you the evidence for that in a moment, because you know this water is neutral. <laughs> and you don't expect a region of water to have negative charge or positive charge. You expect it to be neutral. But we found that it's not. And I'll get back to this one in a moment. Uh, the EZ absorbs light in the ultraviolet region. That's 270 nanometers that it absorbs. So if you want to find out whether this has got some EZ water in it, you shine a light through and see if it absorbs light at that wavelength. It's actually uh, pretty, pretty simple. It's more viscous. It has a consistency like honey. Uh, more, more viscous by a couple of orders of magnitude compared to ordinary water. Uh, the molecules are aligned. Um, and we measured birefringence. Uh, the structure is different through infrared absorption. And the optical properties are different. And the optical properties, what I mean is the refractive index. So I think many of you are familiar with refractive index. You know, like a lens has a different refractive index. It bends light. This is similar. And the measurements were done by two guys from Moscow who didn't know each other. One's a biologist and passed. And the other one is a, a physical scientist. And they published in the same year, and they got the same result. Uh, even quantitatively, they both found that the refractive index was 11%, as much as 11% higher than that of, uh, of water. So this is, as I said, this is uh, eight out of at least 12 different um, uh, characterizations that show a difference from ordinary water. So we know something has gone on there, going on that's different. Um, and, and the point is that the EZ is not neutral. That's one of the uh, findings. It's not neutral like ordinary water. And I'll show you um, a slide that indicates that without um, going into the full, full evidence. So what you see here is a piece of naphion. And right here is water. And as I mentioned to you, next to the naphion is an exclusion zone. And you can actually see. Uh, I'm not sure about the lighting here, whether you can see, but this is clear. There's no, no dye. This is where we've put a dye. And the dye is a pH-sensitive dye. Remember litmus paper? Uh, the stuff you stick in changes color if it's acid or base, whatever. These molecules are from, uh, from litmus paper, but they're soluble, and you can put them in the water. And they show something that's pretty. Um, maybe this deserves to be in the Louvre, where I was yesterday for an hour or so. Um, anyway, um, the color distribution is, I, I think, very pretty. And I'll get back to that. In, in a moment, but with this, with this situation, we wanted to check to see if this was neutral. We fully expected it was going to be neutral, because after all, it's just water of some sort. And the surprise what, was that it was not. We made the measurements using very fine electrodes. They're called microelectrodes. Some of you may be familiar. You know, they're glass, and they taper to a point with an opening um, that is less than one micrometer filled with a salt solution and a wire sticking out. And you can, you can stick them into your cells, for example, and measure your uh, cell potential without destroying the cell. 
um, it's been used now for something like 60 years. And guess who invented it? The same Gilbert Ling, who's 100 years old right now, um, should have won a Nobel Prize for it because people who modified it later um, to measure properties of membrane channels and such did win Nobel Prizes. And if Gilbert had not invented this electrode, um, these guys wouldn't have gotten their Nobel Prize. So um, he missed on, on that one. And uh, well, he might live forever. We'll see if he gets his prize. OK, so, so what else is interesting about this? Um, this is, uh, this is negatively charged. Uh, we confirmed that with these electrodes. But it doesn't make sense if you think about it, right? Because what is the experiment? The experiment is you take a piece of naphion and you put it in the chamber. And then you pour water. And the water is neutral, right? And uh, how is it possible that you start with neutral water and you get a zone that has negative charge? It doesn't make sense. So the first thought is you guys must have made an error. We knew we didn't make an error because my Russian friend, who was in the laboratory at the time, um, was we were doing the experiment. And he said, this is just impossible. It, it can't be. So he telephoned his wife in Russia. Um, Hello, dear, or whatever it is in, in, in Russian. Repeat this experiment. And they were working with gels. And they were working with microelectrodes, studying something different. And so within a few days, we had the answer back. They got the same result that we got. So we're very happy uh, about that. So, uh, so still, the question remained, if, if indeed this region is negatively charged, although we started with something neutral, um, there must be some positive charge somewhere else. Because the only mechanism, if, if we didn't make an error, the only possible mechanism we could think of was that the water molecule must be splitting. Just like the first step in photosynthesis, you know, the, the water splits into H plus and OH minus. Um, but if so, we've 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 identified a negative zone. Is there a positive zone somewhere else? You see, we we expected that, and the answer is you can see it here, uh, right here, because the color. So these colors for this pH sensitive dye, uh, the red color here means a pH of three or less. Huge numbers of protons here, uh, fewer here, and then this is back to neutral with this distribution. So it looked as though somehow, we didn't know how at the moment, somehow the water molecules that we were putting in were splitting into positive and, and negative, you see. Uh, and if if this is true, you know, it's easy for us scientists. Um, um, I, I guess the classic expression is only scientists love their models more than artists. <laughs> uh, so of course, we, we, we wanted this to be correct, but we, we wanted to make sure. So you stick one electrode in here and one electrode in here with a resistor in between, because you should, you should have current flow between plus and minus. Right, if this is correct, because you have a charge separation. And here is the first of many experiments that demonstrates that. This is current, and this is time. And you can see there's a current flow. It diminishes over a uh, short time. And there's a plateau that is fairly uh, enduring. It's not zero. You don't have zero. Here is zero current. So you have current flowing from the plus to the minus. And we were very happy about that, because uh, the only way you can actually get current flow is if you've got plus in one region and minus in another region. And so uh, apparently, we, we could find that. And, and we were happy. So, and so what we've demonstrated uh, is, is that if you have a hydrophilic surface uh, next to water, what happens is next to this hydrophilic surface, the easy water builds. And the easy water has a negative charge. And here's the water that hasn't undergone transition. And instead of be being neutral, it's got positive charge. So it's like a battery in water. So we found a battery. And, and excuse me. And this, of course, applies in your body, too. And we don't think about electrical energy as having any particular role inside your body or inside the plant's uh, uh, body. But apparently, that, that is the case. Electrical uh, charge separation, like a battery, may supply a good deal of the energy uh, unexpectedly uh, in both animals and plants. So to summarize so far, um, 
it's a heavy lunch with wine, so you might be asleep. <laughs> um, there's a region next to hydrophilic surfaces that's liquid crystalline. It's got negative charge. It excludes solutes profoundly. And although I represented this as a stack of dipoles, I'll show you in a few moments that this is not correct. Uh, we were kind of shocked to find that it's not correct. I'll tell you why in, in a moment. But I think this model is wrong, even though this very picture appeared in my previous book, uh, the one I showed you that was selected by the, the child. Um, and I'll tell you what I think is right, because uh, there's uh, a lot of implication for for a function. And this region, this ordered region, it may extend very far uh, from the surface. And by very far, what are we talking about in terms of molecules? Um, not two or three molecules or 20 or 30, but millions. Millions of mole molecular layers that are organized. Um, this is different from anything that you'll read in any textbook, but if our evidence is correct, um, this is what the situation is. So this is not a new finding, I've got to tell you. Um, it was theorized more than 100 years ago uh, by Sir William Hardy. This guy was a famous colloid and physical chemist. And he said, hey, you guys, something is really wrong uh, because there are a lot of observations on water that don't fit the theory that we all know where there are three phases, uh, uh, solid, liquid, and vapor. There's got to be a fourth phase. So at the time, it was only theorized, but there was no experimental evidence. And I, it, I put this name down to show you that the idea that there is a fourth phase is not <coughs> new for us. It's been around for a hundred years. And one of the, my favorite people to talk about um, regarding this is Albert St. Georgi. Some of you may know his name. Um, Hungarian scientist, won a Nobel Prize, discovered vitamin C, was considered to be a, no, a Nobelist among Nobelists, and a brilliant guy. And he knew that there was something about the water that was, was different, uh, especially in biology, but not just biology. And um, um, so uh, one, of it, one of the favorite expressions that come from him is, life is dancing to the tune of solids, of water dancing to the tune of solids. Uh, and I think he was, he was right on. So water is essential for life. OK, now I mentioned that these dipole, the dipole idea is wrong. And you're wondering, why, why is this so important? And again, I repeat, unless you you know the structure, you, you have a hard time figuring out the function. And of course, the function, if this is there, it's got to play some really important role. And, and so what, what's wrong with the dipole picture? You know, it's aesthetically pleasing, <laughs> simple, but it's wrong. So why, why am I so sure it's wrong? Well, see, the region has negative charge. Dipoles are neutral. Dipole has plus and minus, right? So you got a little bean with a plus and a minus, right? And you can, you can stack <coughs> these dipoles from, from here to the moon, and you'll never get a negative charge because each one is neutral. So, and the, the experimental results showed a negative charge. So uh, something is wrong. I don't want to take you through um, all of the reasoning. Um, and um, it, it's in my, my book that I'll tell you about. I think the book is here. Uh, they told me for sale. Um, so uh, the, the revised easy structure that we came up with looks like this. Uh, again, I'm not giving you the rationale, but, uh, but there's plenty of, I think, clear rationale. And it looks like this. So, so here is the dipole material, and here's water. Right, sitting. I'm sorry. Here is the hydrophilic material, and here's the water. And what happens is, out of the water uh, grow these layers, and these are we call them easy layers, and they grow one at a time. So you see that one, and that one, and so on. And the structure of each one looks something like this. Uh, it it's um, it. A uh, honeycomb array made of hexagons, and as you know, hexagons are very prevalent in nature. And it contains um, oxygens and hydrogens here. And those of you who know the structure of ice will know that the structure of ice is very similar to this. Not the same, uh, but it's it's pretty similar. And that also is an ordered ordered crystal. Now, if you think that this is H2O. 
you're wrong, <laughs> because if you were to count the number of oxygens and the number of hydrogens in each unit cell, um, the result that you'd come up with is not H2O, but actually H3O2. So it's a different molecular um, uh, uh, formula. And if you think about it, it can't be H2O, you see, because H2O is neutral. And you can't stack layers of something neutral and get negative charge out of it. Each layer has to be negatively charged. And H3O2 is negatively charged. If it were H4O2, that is double this, it would be neutral. But you're missing one positive charge here, leaving this compound negative. So we're fairly certain that this is the uh, correct um, um, uh, chemistry of, uh, of this. Uh, again, if you think about it, um, the structure, I borrowed this slide from a, a colleague. The main lesson in chemistry, the structure defines the properties. So if you want to find out the properties of the water that, as I suggested to you, fills your body and fills the plant, you need to know something about the structure. Now, you'd never guess that if you put carbons together in a sheet-like uh, fashion that now we know of graphene discovered um, a 10, 15 years ago, uh, got a Nobel Prize, as someone pointed out, this is 200 times stronger than steel. And you'd never guess that from, uh, from the chemistry of one carbon uh, molecule, but that's the result. And, and the same with easy water. If you take the properties of one water molecule, it's not the same as having an aggregate uh, this way, of easy water, with a completely different um, a chemical and mechanical properties, different from bulk water. And that will be important in, in what's coming. So uh, if you have, as I suggested, a liquid crystalline structure, like easy structure, um, we, we know that liquid crystals can, can be solidified. And if this structure is really a liquid crystal, we'd expect that it could be solidified. So the example that many of you may know about is <laughs> making sugar crystals. So you start with, with a solution, uh, which was showed by, I think, Pasteur uh, to start with, was a, a liquid crystal that is a sugar solution. And, and you put a, a string uh, in there. And if you leave it long enough, what you wind up with is something that looks like this, which some of you know is pretty <laughs> delicious uh, to taste. So, so it's a liquid crystal that you can solidify. So a question you might ask, although maybe you didn't ask it, is, well, you know, if you think that, if you think that uh, this easy structure is a liquid crystal, you might think that you could solidify it. Uh, at room temperature. Now, this would be a shock to everybody because it's like taking some, some kind of water and creating a solid, not at the low temperature, but at room temperature. I mean, it sounds impossible um, uh, to do. And so the question is, can you do it? Can the EZ liquid crystal be solidified at room temperature? And the guy who's done it is Vittorio Elia um, <coughs> from Napoli. Uh, and and what he did is he took a sheet of naphtha, or sorry, what, it's not what he did, his idea, but his wife does the work. Uh, so, so his wife did this laborious experiment. So you, you, take, um, you take a Petri dish and you put a slab of naphion, the material that builds very nice EZs, and you add some water. And, and so this is the naphion sitting here. And you put the water, and over five, 10 minutes or so, EZ forms. And they started with that idea. And they took a roller, and they rolled the water, they pushed the EZ, plus inevitably some ordinary water, uh, into the edge of the dish. And then they repeated it, and they repeated it, and they repeated it. Um, and they could produce, well, OK. So they, <coughs> they took the material that they got out, which should be easy water plus some ordinary uh, water. And if they just put it into a beaker, what happens is it looks something like this after some period of time. So this is ordinary water. And the clouds that you see here are easy water. Think about the clouds that you see up there. Uh, if you just took water and put it in, in, into the beaker, you wouldn't find this, but, but they find that. Anyway. They could take this, this combination, even before it formed the cloud, and they put it into um, um, uh, a, a device that's called a lyophilizer. And protein biochemists use this to get the free water out of the protein. And they did this. And what they wound up with uh, looks like this. 
So the stuff that's sitting at the bottom of this flask is solid, easy water at room temperature. And uh, Vittoria was kind enough to give us a sample of this stuff in a tiny little vial. And I think that, I think that the value of this stuff in the tiny vial exceeds the value of platinum in, in the same vial because of the number of weeks maybe months it took his wife to produce this stuff. And I, I must admit to you that we squandered it. I gave it to a little bit to each of the people in the lab to play with. It feels, it feels thread-like if you put it in between your fingers and it almost disintegrates into a powder. They checked using uh, a mass spectrometer to see that this was not impurities in the water or anything like that. And they found it was hydrogen and oxygen. So, so easy water. At, this is water, some kind of water at room temperature that's a solid, if you can imagine. Not too many people are paying attention to it. I don't know why. For me, it's an extraordinary finding. Uh, OK, question three. Uh, can crystalline water explain some of those counterintuitive anomalies that I, I started with? Uh, for example, here, here's the cloud. And, and by the way, another anomaly that I won't address now, but if there's time at the end, I'm happy to answer questions. This cloud consists of water. Um, water is heavier than air, right? If you pour water, it goes down. It's pulled by gravitation. So how come this cloud is floating? It consists of water droplets, little droplets. What, what keeps it in the air? Anybody know? Yeah, but I, I mean, so gravitation is pulling down. Right, pulls you down. Yeah. It's while you're sitting on this chair comfortably, but um, could you levitate? <laughs> uh, not, yet. not yet, but you're you're working on it. I know. Uh, but the cloud is levitating, right? And so, what keeps it from coming down by the force of gravity? You never thought about that, did you? You walk outside, you see these beautiful clouds, and you can't answer the question. I think what keeps the cloud up there? Sorry. Um, I mean, it's an interesting idea, but what about a magnetic field? So water is not magnetic. It's not like iron. And charge? Well, the negative charge is, is stationary. If you have charges moving, then they create a current, and it's affected by a magnetic field. But these charges are, you know, when you go up in the plane, you don't see much action in, in some of these clouds, like the white puffy ones. They're situated up there. And why do they stay up there? Anyway, uh, maybe, um, maybe at the end, uh, because there are a few more properties of water that I, I want to discuss. And I, I'll leave you in mystery, because I think I know the answer to this. Uh, uh, but I don't want to reveal it right at the moment. Uh, it's actually extremely simple. Uh, um, yeah. A structure of the air was a suggestion. Um, uh, it, it's possible, but um, uh, it's not so obvious how, how this uh, could happen. Uh, please think that next time you go outside about <laughs> what keeps the cloud. And by the way, usually it holds its water, but sometimes it doesn't. So uh, who gives the switch to turn on the rain on uh, the microbes? So I, uh, another suggestion was microbes, but I, I've heard a, a lot of suggestions. But um, maybe some of them are correct, but I, I think there's a, another simpler explanation. But I will leave you in mystery until, until the end. Um, <laughs> OK? <laughs> and meanwhile, you can think about, uh, yeah, please. Uh, oh, for the angels. I got it. That might be the right answer <laughs> for the angels. Uh, but uh, it's a, you've got to admit, it's a good question. You know? and, and I think that nobody around the room knows the answer. And so please wait for my next book. <laughs> oh, please. Um, so th the suggestion is there's an exclusion zone between here and here. But um, you can see clouds if you look up over Paris, right? No sea, but, but clouds. Um, and sometimes, by the way, you can see a stack of clouds, not just one. But sometimes there's one here, one here, and one here. How come? So these are, these are questions <laughs> that arise from, um, uh, from very simple phenomena that we see every day, but uh, questions too simple even for us to think about answering them. <laughs> but they exist. OK. OK, so the, the question was this. Um, 
how, how is it possible that, at least in this, in this situation, you have evaporation coming from here, the same as it's coming from here, but there's no cloud above, <laughs> right? And so the, the impression is that the water that's evaporating must somehow get attracted to this cloud and attracted to this cloud. And then you might have another cloud sitting here or somewhere else. But, but the, the ordinary explanation is you have one continuous cloud from all over the sea. But sometimes, sometimes you do, but in some cases you don't. And, and the principle, let me explain to you what I think is, is going on. It's a simple principle that applies um, to water and also applies to many colloids. And that is something like this. So imagine, imagine you have um, one hydrophilic particle that builds an exclusion zone here that's negatively charged. And remember, beyond the exclusion zone is positive charges here. And you got another one sitting uh, right here that's in the same situation. So now, if I ask you a question, these two particles are negatively charged. They have the same charge. So the question is, um, which way, if, you put, if, you, if I were to drop these two particles in, in this water close to each other, what would happen to the distance between them? They have the same charge. Would they, the distance increase or decrease? What do you think? Well, increase. You think increase, you think increase. Everybody agree? OK. Um, so the answer is that it decreases. <laughs> Sorry, this is not my crazy idea. This comes, uh, the idea comes from uh, the famous Nobel physicist Richard Feynman. Um, um, some of you m may know his name. He, I think many people consider him to be the Einstein of the second half of the 20th century, Richard Feynman. Um, every physicist, uh, at least in the US, every graduate student in physics reads his lectures uh, in um, in, on physics, uh, partly because he was a funny guy, but also he knew what he was talking about. And in his Nobel lecture, he talked about the like, likes, like phenomenon. So what does that mean? Yeah, right. They like each other. You know, if you like, you come together, right? So he said, like, likes, like. Why does like, like, like? Because of an intermediate of unlikes. So you have positive charges in between. Why do you have positive charges in between? Well, because remember, when uh, uh, this is not what Feynman said, but this is how I think it works, because Feynman never, never describes where the uh, intermediate positive charges would lie. But we know from the, what I've presented to you that when this EZ forms with its negative charge, the positive charges, because the water is splitting into negative and positive, all around this will be positive charges. In the middle, you have a lot of positive charges because you have a contribution from this one and a contribution from this one. So you have a lot of positive charges here, and the positive charges then pull on the negative, pull on the negative, and draw them together. So if someone asked you if you, if you put two negative charges into water, uh, two particles in, in, into water, uh, what happens to the distance between them, most often people will get the wrong answer uh, because experimentally they come together. And people have, have described this, and we have a paper that we produced uh, showing exactly the same thing. It's counterintuitive. But actually, I got to tell you that the principle has been known for almost a 1,000 years. How do I know this? Well, some of you know um, the first novel that was ever written um, was uh, written in Japan about a thousand years ago. It's called The Tale of Genji. So what is The Tale of Genji about? Well, The Tale of Genji describes clans, uh, two clans that were, were always in battle, fighting each other for, for dominance. And, uh, and the tale describes the only way that you can actually bring these clans together is by putting the right entity in, in between. And so like, likes, like because of an intermediate of unlike. So the principle of like, likes, like is ancient. Uh, and back to our situation here, uh, because of the unlike sitting in between, these are pulled together. And when, when do they stop moving? You get stability when the attractive force, that is the plus in the middle pulling these minuses, is equal to the repulsive force, this repelling this. When they're equal, the movement stops. They won't necessarily touch each other. They'll stop 
at some distance. And if you have many, instead of just two, you have something that is known as a colloid, excuse me, a colloid crystal, uh, where the particles actually are sticking together, keeping nearby one another because of the like, likes, like phenomenon. So the phenomenon is straightforward. In fact, if you had yogurt this morning, probably the consistency of the yogurt uh, is due to this, this phenomenon, the like, likes, like. Uh, and uh, why did I bring this up? First of all, because it's fun, but secondly, because going back to the clouds. So what's the structure of a cloud? Well, the structure of a cloud is mostly droplets that are can vary in size between 10 micrometers and, and maybe up to a half a millimeter or so, even, even larger. These droplets are negatively charged, and the region in between them uh, consists of positive charges. So the positive charges act like a kind of glue that brings it together, you see, and that's why a cloud is an entity like this. But if you have another one of these droplets sitting, for example, uh, here or here, it's pulled toward the positive charge which sits near the edge, and the cloud grows, um, you see. And, and then you can explain why the water that's evaporating from here, which consists of little, little droplets that, that form, are attracted to the cloud. And the cloud builds because of the like, likes, like phenomenon. So I think that's what, what happens. So another phenomenon oops, um, is this. Any of you tried um, putting, putting a paper clip on top of the water? <laughs> no? Yes, you did. What happens? Uh, it floats, right, if you do it carefully. Or, or if you take a pin, if you put it very carefully on top, it'll float despite it's heavy, right? If you put it underneath the surface, it falls right to the bottom, you see. So question is, uh, this, is this one is an old Hungarian coin uh, that's put uh, on the surface of the water. And you can see, if you believe the internet, uh, it floats just like the paper clip. It's actually fairly lightweight, but it's certainly denser than the water. It floats. It shouldn't float because, you know, gravitation is pulling down, and this is more dense than the water, so it, it should sink to the bottom. Um, so the usual explanation is that the surface of the water has a lot of tension, a lot of surface tension. Um, and you can read about this in the textbook, and it'll explain the, uh, why. But we wondered whether this is actually sufficient to, to explain it. And so we, we studied the surface of the water to find out. Bless you. <laughs> Uh, and we found that this easy water or crystalline water grows at the air-water interface. Um, and so the experiment looks like this. These are, this chamber that you see here is uh, built from two pieces of glass here and here, sealed around the edge to make a chamber. And into this chamber we poured water plus microspheres. And that's why it's cloudy, because the microspheres scatter light. Um, in here, so it's it's cloudy. So we did the experiment, and uh, so you have air on top, you have the meniscus right here, and then we noticed that a clear zone formed. It took uh, something like uh, 10, 15, 20 minutes, up to 30 minutes for this to form. Uh, essentially a millimeter or so in size. And this region, it was clear, therefore it had no microspheres and it looked like an EZ was forming right at the surface. We stuck microelectrodes in and we found that it had negative electrical potential. And in the next slide I'll show you that this is not just water. It's actually EZ water. It has a, it has a, a thick, it has a a consistency like a gel or like a thick rubber band that runs from one side to the other. Let me, let me show you the evidence for that. So this is just like the previous slide. Here's the cloudy zone. Um, and here's a clear zone just beneath the surface. And what we're going to do is we're going to touch the top with this glass rod, which is going to mechanically perturb the surface. Um, and you can, you'll, see that, you'll see that the thickness of this zone hardly changes in, despite the medical, mechanical perturbation. So here's a video. So we're coming down, we're lifting the surface, and you can see the height of this dark region changes 
practically not at all. So it's not just water, it's something that behaves like a gel or that behaves like a rubber band. And so um, we interpret this result and also the paper clip and the pin as an indication that something beneath the surface, um, many structured layers, uh, just like a, a thick EZ, or in fact, a, a thick EZ creates the high surface tension that allows this to float, provided you don't disturb the surface by agitating or uh, you have to do it very carefully. And, and the reason this is fun is that because it explains this creature that some of you may know about. It's a lizard from the Amazon, and it spends a good deal of its time on a tree branch, but you know, when it gets the urge, nobody knows exactly where that urge comes from, um, what it does is it jumps into the water and it walks on water, you see. And so the question is, well, how does it walk on the water? And, um, and we think it's because this water uh, has a thick EZ at the top and the character of the EZ is not like regular water. It's much stiffer and therefore it can walk on the water. And the same principle may apply um, to anything that floats on the top of the water because you have easy layers at the top. Um, if you have a ship or something else that's pressing down, at least in part, not fully, in part, the, one of the reasons why it floats is it has these layers of easy water which pr provide some buoyancy. Okay, well, another point is that crystals can be stiff. Uh, some of you have a diamond or um, another, um, another gem of some sort, and they're crystals, and they can be pretty stiff. And so if we return to this slide, uh, this is stiff. How do we know it's stiff? Well, um, you can calculate the stiffness at, um, based on, on the uh, diameter of this, the amount of droop, and the distance. You can create the stiffness. And let me tell you, it's very stiff. Um, it, it's stiff enough that you can almost walk across it <laughs> if, you, if you could do that. And so water, ordinary water is not like that. You've never seen, I think, uh, any kind of water that does anything <coughs> like this. Um, but if it's a liquid crystal, no, it could be anywhere between uh, fragile and weak to s as strong as your, as your diamond, you see. And, um, and we think that this is the explanation. So the answer to question number three is, uh, yeah, uh, liquid crystal and water explains many anomalies. What, was the, what is the other explanation for surface tension? The other explanation is, is that, that um, molecules of water always have a tendency to link to one another, forming so-called hydrogen bonds. Okay, so in this glass of water, um, many of the molecules are at least transiently stuck to one another. These bonds are supposed to be made and, and broken pretty quickly. If you're at the top, the guys at the top have a problem because they, they want to connect with a molecule up on there. There's no molecule up there. So they will lie down. Uh, and as they lie down, they can connect with another water molecule. Therefore, at the top molecular layer, you have more interconnections between water molecules. And therefore, it should be stiffer. So that's one molecular layer. And the question is, one molecular layer is like a third of a nanometer uh, thick. Uh, that's something like, what is it? Uh, um, I think one thirtieth or so, this thickness of a cell membrane. And the question, you know, can you get enough stiffness out of this to explain it? That's why we were skeptical. I think the answer is no. Yeah, so he's saying that if you have a hose or a pipe and you put it under high pressure, um, it tends to stick near your body. Um, but l let me say, does that mean there is flow or no flow? There is flow. Okay, yeah. So the first, the first part of my answer to your question is please wait for the second half. I'm going to, to, to discuss something about flow, and I think you may be able to infer an explanation from what I talk about. However, <laughs> um, I, I would like to suggest to you uh, a proposal uh, to uh, think about right now. And, when, and it's similar to a uh, um, uh, flow vessel like xylem, for example. If you, um, if, if you have flow um, through 
through the tube, what happens is that EZ negative charge builds just inside the tube, um, and a positive charge exists in the region of flow. I, I'll show you evidence for that. Now, if the outside of the tube has negative charge, so we know the principle of induction from Faraday, Michael Faraday, that is, if I have, uh, uh, if, if I have a positive charge here, it will induce negative charge on this surface. Okay, positive charge induces negative, and if it's, this is negative, and it, it will induce positive. It's always inducing an opposite charge, which means these two surfaces will come together. So anytime you have a, any body with a charge, doesn't matter which polarity, it will induce the opposite charge on anything nearby, and the two will have an attraction. So if there's enough uh, negative charge around the pipe that you're talking about, it will induce the opposite charge on your body and draw them together. I don't know if this explanation is correct, but this is my first interpretation of what might be happening, and uh, you've provided enough stimulus for me to go and try it. So we, we, um, we dealt with three questions so far, and now we come to question four. This is a battery that we're talking about because because uh, minus and plus are separated from each other. And everybody knows that you know, your cell phone will die down pretty quickly unless you recharge it. So every, every battery needs to get charged. And so where does the energy come for charging this battery? Because without, without that energy, you won't get anything. Um, so um, we know the answer now, and I'll, uh, I'll tell it to you. But I, I have to tell you that it took us several years to figure out where the energy came from uh, before we, we had the right experiment. And there was, I was giving a talk. I, I speak often to the undergraduate students, the young students. And I asked that very question. I, I presented some of this material uh, in abbreviated form. And I said to them, where does the energy come from? And although it took us several years to figure it out, one student raised his hand and he said the correct answer very tentatively, as though he was embarrassed to say so. And he got the right answer, and, and the right answer was uh, light. And, um, and we immediately took him into our laboratory to do experiments because the guy was brilliant. It took him a few milliseconds to figure out the answer, but uh, it took us a few years to figure out the answer. And so I guess the moral of the story is that the students know much more than we do. So how did we, how did we find out? Well, we found out because of another student who was working already in my laboratory. And, and this student did something that he wasn't supposed to do. Um, he was doing one experiment, and he noticed uh, with the chamber was sitting on, on the laboratory bench, and right next to the chamber was a lamp, uh, one of these gooseneck lamps. Uh, and he turned on the lamp, and out of curiosity, he took the lamp and shined it on the chamber to see what would happen, because, you know, people are curious. We, we never thought to do that, but he thought to do that. And uh, here's what, what he found. This is, obviously, this is not a real lamp, but this is real data from one of the early experiments. And this is a piece of naphion that sits here next to water and the microspheres. And the exclusion zone is shown here. It contains no microspheres. And usually, next to a long sheet of naphion, the exclusion zone is uniform uh, like this. But when he shined the lamp, after about five minutes or so, we could see in the microscope that the exclusion zone had grown in the region that was being illuminated. And uh, when he took the lamp away, it went back to the control value, which was uniform uh, along the surface of, of the naphion. So it didn't take a rocket scientist to figure out that you know if light was building <laughs> was building the exclusion zone, then maybe it was the photons, the light, that was supplying the energy uh, to build the exclusion zone. So we did a whole bunch of experiments to check this out and to check which wavelengths were. Uh, most important. So we, we tried many wavelengths from uh, scanning through from the um, ultraviolet short wavelength to the medium wavelengths, which are visible light, to infrared. 
And we found from these experiments, I won't show you the data because it's too much, it's published, the most effective was infrared. So now, I think most of you will think infrared, well, what's infrared? Where do, where do I find infrared, right, infrared wavelengths? And, and you know that if you, if you look at, uh, at your electric range, uh, when the coil is, is growing brightly, bright orange, uh, it's giving off heat and it's giving off infrared energy. We, we call it light, although you can't see it, but it's still called infrared light or infrared radiant energy. And, but it's quite true uh, that, it, it, that this is giving off your oven, your toaster, and such, giving off infrared energy. But what people don't realize is that it's all over the place. Uh, everything around you is giving off infrared energy. So if, if we were to close the curtains around here and it's dark, um, and if I had a camera that was, was sensitive to infrared wavelengths instead of uh, usually visible wavelengths, uh, even if it were dark here and you couldn't see anything with your eyes, the infrared camera will pick up a beautiful image of all of you and um, with a glass of water and my watch sitting here and uh, my briefcase, uh, etc. And that's why it's used as infrared cameras are used as night lights because even though it's dark out and you can't see anything, you've got plenty of infrared light coming from all over the place. And this is very important, and um, I'll come back to its importance in plants in, in, in a few minutes, but it's all there, so it's free. It's literally free energy. You may have learned about free energy in your chemistry class. This is literally free energy. It's free for the taking. It's all over. And because it's free, um, and because it's always there, it means that if you have any hydrophilic material sitting next to water, you will always have some easy water because the infrared energy that's around you will always be there to build the easy water. And if you, if you have more infrared energy, as for example from a lamp, then what happens is it grows. And if you take away that extra infrared energy, it comes back to its ordinary control value. So the energy is always there. Um, and um, and it's free, and therefore you always have some easy water. So it's a simple answer to question number four about where the energy comes from. It comes from light, especially the infrared wavelengths of light, which build easy uh, uh, water. That is not to say that other wavelengths don't contribute, but we found, we found that the most sensitive wavelength is a um, wavelength of 3.0 micrometers, and, um, and that doesn't really mean anything to you, or to, or to most of you, I think, but it's the, it's the wavelength of infrared energy that's, or any <laughs> energy, that's most absorbed by the water. So if you offer this water a series of wavelengths, it absorbs mostly um, at three micrometers in, in, in the water, and that energy that gets absorbed goes into building EZ water. That's the new new um, in information that, that we found. So uh, the energy, the easy buildup is powered by light, photonic energy, and that orders the water and charges the water battery. So the simple situation looks like Hawaii. <laughs> you just lie in the sun and you get energy uh, from the light that's coming, or infrared light especially, that's coming not just fr from the sun, but from, from all over. Now, if you're thinking this late in the afternoon, uh, you'd think, well, you're telling me that this water is absorbing infrared light that's coming from all around. If it's absorbing energy, it can't keep absorbing energy because if it keeps absorbing energy, it will explode. It's got to get rid of that energy somehow. And, and so if it keeps building energy, you, you would expect that this water can do work. Because if it builds energy, the energy must get expended in some kind of work. But you're telling me that you've never seen a glass of water doing work, right? Or maybe you have. Anybody ever seen a glass of water doing work? No? <laughs> I'm going to give you an example of a glass of water doing work. Uh, I, I know it 
You, you'll see in a moment that a glass of water can, can and, and do work. It, energy could be harvested. And this was done, again, by a student who was doing what he was not supposed to do. I don't know if it's only my students who do that, but uh, the, the students have a sense of freedom, and they, they feel they try this or try that. So we had just heard that nafion, which we use in a lot of experiments, although not all the time, it's, it's useful, it also comes in the shape of tubes. It's like a straw. Uh, made of uh, nafion material. And so I asked the student if he would look at the tubes and see if they actually built EZs the way we could see EZs getting built next to a sheet of nafion. And the student went to do his work and, and he found something unexpected and interesting. And I remember distinctly, I was sitting in my office speaking to some visitor who I thought was important, or maybe he wasn't so important, and the student came barging in, um, and he said, hey, there's something I found that I, I want to tell you about. Um, and uh, so he'd, he'd been studying his, this a tube of nafion, a, a couple of millimeters or so <coughs> in, um, in, in diameter, and he said to me, um, and actually, I was kind of happy that he came in because the visitor was not so interesting. <laughs> and, and the student was telling me, he said, I found something, and I thought you'd be pretty interested in it. Well, OK, tell me what you find, <laughs> and why is it so interesting? Um, he said, well, you know, I found flow through this tube, and the flow never stops flowing. OK, so um, I thought, hmm, this is pretty interesting. <laughs> you know, maybe even more interesting than the student thought it was. Because usually, if you have flow in a tube, you need a pressure, like you're talking about your hose. You need a pressure to drive it through, or a pressure gradient, pressure difference. But there's no pressure difference here. It's just sitting there, you know, and, um, and the flow keeps going without, without stopping. So. Uh, he thought it was interesting, and I thought it was super interesting because if true, of course we had to check to see that the student was correct and there was no experimental error, which, which, which we did. This, I, I thought, was really good evidence um, that the light was responsible because where else does the energy come from? All that's happening to this water and tube was that infrared energy was coming in and absorbed by the water, and I thought, you know, if it's being absorbed, it must do something, and I thought, well, maybe the source of energy is somehow, we didn't know exactly how at the time, was coming from the ambient energy from around us um, and is driving this process. And we found, I'll show you, that indeed that, that, was, that was the case. So I was delighted that this student came barging in to, inter to interrupt my meeting with, with the visitor. Um, I don't remember the visitor, but I remember the student coming in. <laughs> Uh, and the way it works is something like this. You take a piece of tubing, and you first fill the tubing uh, with water and microspheres and make sure there are no air bubbles, and then stick it down into the water that contains the microspheres. Look at it in the microscope. We have green light in this case, and, and see what happens. And so here, here is the result in, inside this nafion tube. You can see the exclusion zone here and here. And and the uh, flow keeps going, and I, I stopped the video here, but I can tell you that we've had it going for as much as a day and a half without stopping. Uh, and we know, we, we know pretty much why it stops, and I think we can make it go uh, indefinitely um, by taking the proper measures. So someone came to us and said, ah, we listen. Uh, uh, someone said, oh, it must be some crazy feature of this nafion tube. And so we thought, let's get some other tubes and check it out. It's really difficult to find narrow tubes that are made of hydrophilic materials. So we created essentially the same thing by ourselves. And we created uh, it, it by, by forming a gel uh, and sticking a wire in the gel. And as, as the material forms the gel, we pull the wire out, leaving a tunnel. So we have a, a, um, a piece of gel, like a block of gel, with a tunnel running through from one end to the other. And we take this, this gel and we stick it in water plus microspheres. And 
and here's what you see. So this one is a polyacrylic acid gel. Um, and here's the tunnel that runs from here to here. It's a cylindrical tunnel that runs all the way through. And as soon as you dunk it into the water plus the microspheres, uh, the water plus microspheres enter into this tunnel. And the EZ begins building up here and building up here, uh, forcing all the microspheres right to the center. And if you look at the video of what happens, it flows just the same way as in the Nafion tube. The direction is essentially unpredictable. One day we put it in, it goes this way, and one day it goes this way. And the next day it might go this way or this way. So we did a series of experiments uh, by tapering the gel. We thought if we taper it, uh, ta taper the tunnel, we thought if we taper it with uh, uh, smaller at one end and bigger at the other, maybe we learn something. And we did. Uh, they always, the flow always um, began at the bigger end and ended um, and came out this, the smaller end. And so we thought we had the answer, or at least part of the answer, because we could then determine which direction. But some months later, a different student tried it with a different gel, and he got the opposite result. So, so the answer is, we don't know, but um, we're pretty sure that there needs to be some asymmetry. Because if you have symmetry, if you have um, uh, a tunnel that's uniform, uh, and everything is uniform in your experiment, including the lighting, remember, if, if we do the experiment here with more light coming on one side than another, that creates asymmetry. And I'll, I'll show you what we, we're pretty sure is the mechanism, and you can understand that if you have too much asymmetry or some asymmetry with, with more light coming in this way and less light, you may get a bigger EZ here and a smaller EZ, and if the size of the EZ is relevant, I'll show you in a moment, then that could help determine the flow. So this, in summary, we don't know which way in a typical experiment which way it's going to flow, but we know that there should be some kind of asymmetry, otherwise there won't be flow. We have found that in 10% or so of the cases, we get no flow. And we think that the no flow are situations where everything is too symmetrical, too uniform, in which case, whatever force is driving it this way is an equal force driving it this way. Les thermiciens connaissent bien les infrarouges. Et les infrarouges, c'est à la fois quelque chose qui peut donner de l'énergie et prendre de l'énergie en fonction de la masse et de la densité de la matière. Et moi, je me pose cette question-là. Est-ce que la température et la différence de température entre l'eau et les matières qui environnent le système n'ont pas une influence sur à la fois soit donner de l'énergie, soit prendre de l'énergie en fonction de, de la radiation de, ces, de, de cet infrarouge Est-ce qu'il est, va dans un sens ou est-ce qu'il va dans l'autre Est-ce qu'il pompe ou est-ce qu'il donne Non, il almost certainly absorbes l'énergie parce que si vous you measure, et nous avons fait des mesures dans similar systèmes, ça se up. Et donc l'infrared énergie est causing some, some heating. Um, and, and therefore, it should be conferring, giving energy to the system. And uh, if it gives energy to the system in, in the same way that energy, infrared energy coming from the surroundings are giving energy to, to the system, um, it, it's the energy that is being given that drives the process, we, we presume, not, not the other way around. So you're suggesting that it may be that energy coming from the tube and given back to the environment is somehow involved with, with creating this? Um, we, we hadn't thought about that possibility, I, um, simply because the radiant energy coming from the infrared sources is being absorbed um, by this. So we can, um, uh, and I, I was going to mention this before the question started, uh, if, if it's absorbing energy from, from the outside, um, and that energy is driving the system, if you supply more energy, you should get faster flow, right? So we tried this experiment. We increased the intensity of light, and we found that we could get up to five times speed increase by um, increasing the um, intensity of the infrared uh, illumination. See, so, so um, we, we think, therefore, it makes sense uh, that 
that uh, if you supply that it's being absorbed because if you if you give more energy to the system you get more action you get faster flow so we think the energy is being absorbed and let me now proceed to the next two slides to illustrate what the mechanism might be because we we think we understand so so here is a tube of, in this case, it's a tube of naphion uh, sitting in, it's a section of a tube. It's uh, sitting vertically um, in, the, in the chamber and surrounded by microspheres and water. So the first thing you see is that there's an exclusion zone right here at the inside and also another exclusion zone outside. So both surfaces build exclusion zones here and here. And out here are more microspheres and more microspheres here. So we know that we've got an EZ. Now if you think about the implications, so you have an EZ, we're talking now about the inside, you have an EZ with negative charge here, and then you have protons that are sitting right here with positive charge. And the protons, as they build in their concentration, they repel each other, they're free, they want to get out. So their tendency to get out of the inside of the tube, they'll go either this way or they'll go this way, whichever one uh, predominates. And we don't know exactly what, what that means, but we know that if flow begins in this direction, protons do come out of here. They flow into the chamber right here, and the chamber eventually gets filled with protons. See, so, so we think the mechanism has something to do with the protons in the center, in the core, that are created as the EZ builds. Um, and we know if you apply more light, more infrared energy, um, you, you get a bigger easy buildup and therefore more protons and more of a tendency to go out. And that's why we think it's faster with more light. So this is, this is the mechanism that we, we, we think is, is going to explain it. Um, and, and so the, the conclusion of the slides that I've shown you is that you know, work is done because in order to drive flow through a tube, you need to do, uh, um, that involves work because you have to overcome friction. And as I said, you know, usually it's pressure that drives it through. Um, without pressure, nothing will flow. But we have flow in this case and um, it needs energy of some sort and therefore some kind of energy absorption from the environment because we have nothing else to, to uh, hypothesize uh, seems to be necessary. So, so we find basically that water is a trans producer of light energy. So this water, as I said, this water can do work. It transduces energy. If you have the right geometry, uh, you can have input energy from the absorption of light or the absorption of infrared light, infrared energy. And, and that, that energy is capable of doing work. If you put a tube in here, that's the right, um, right geometry. So this water, this water is a transducer. I think most people don't think of it as a transducer, but this is a transducer of light energy into mechanical energy and also electrical energy. Now, that sounds weird, but you people know very well uh, that this stuff here on the left gets its energy from light. You see, um, and, and so the plant absorbs the light um, and builds chemical potential, and the chemical pet potential um, feeds the growth and metabolism and bending and, and what have you. So I'm, I'm suggesting here that the same thing happens in water, um, that the water is doing the same as the plant. And it's no surprise because the plant is mostly water. Um, and therefore, uh, the same thing that we know is happening inside the plant appears also to be happening inside the water. And so we, uh, out of this idea, we come up with an expression for water, E equals H2O. Now, it looks like some iconic equation, and I know the units don't match, but I think you get the idea that, that in the same way that a plant can contain potential energy, the water either outside the plant or inside the plant contains potential energy. The water uh, is doing that. And, um, and I, I just remind you that um, about the photosynthesis, about which you guys probably know more than I know, uh, but I know that the first step of photosynthesis is 
the light comes in and it breaks the water into H plus and OH minus. And this is supposed to be or said to be 100% efficient. That's what we found in a more generic kind of, um, a more generic kind of um, uh, setting that, so it doesn't have to be chlorophyll. It could be many different, um, many different surfaces, many different hydrophilic surfaces that could do much the same, maybe not as effectively, but um, can, can do it, do, do much the same. And, and uh, if, if it's true, we don't know if it's true, that that first step of photosynthesis is more like what we what we uh, showed than most people think of um, that will be interesting it would be that you know in, in plants and in certain bacteria the first step of photosynthesis is actually one special example of the more generic um, thing that that we found uh, over here. And that would solve one big problem. And the big problem is when, when you think about the first step in photosynthesis, <coughs> you think of H2O breaking into H plus and OH minus. But there's a problem with that uh, that one of my uh, colleagues from Brazil identified. If you create H plus and OH minus, they don't want to get away from each other because plus and minus like each other. They, they what what would induce them to separate? Well, we have a mechanism uh, that could explain it. I haven't gone into detail, into molecular detail about how it occurs, but, um, but we have something that where we know the minus and plus can separate, despite what we know about physics, which implies that plus and minus don't want to separate. You see, and that question, as far as I know, has never been addressed, uh, seriously addressed in, in, in um, uh, plant uh, physiology and bio, biochemistry. Okay, so uh, the last part of the talk is, why is all of this important? Um, um, and I, I think that it could be foundational uh, for any of all uh, science, uh, both inside plants and outside plants, involving water, molecules, and light. And um, another is, is that it could be foundational for health. And we're talking now about both animals and, and plants, and I'll give you a few examples coming up in, in this, and maybe try to leave a little time for some questions at the end. So a question that you might ask is, does human biology use radiant energy? So we never think of ourselves as plants, right? Uh, you know, we're, we're animals. We can forage, we can get our energy, we can get our food. But, you know, we're receiving radiant energy all the time uh, from, from the environment. And, and suppose you are Mother Nature, and you've invented, created whatever, plants, green plants, bacteria, and you've got an energy transduction mechanism that works pretty well. And you decide, hey, wouldn't it be cool to um, invent animals too, instead of, instead of plants and such. Now, you have two options. And one is to dis discard the plant energetic transduction mechanism altogether. A t photosynthesis, ah, that's for green plants. For animals, we want something special. Or you could keep it in reserve as a, a supplement to augment whatever energy transduction mechanism you're using in animals. In Mother Nature being w wise, creative, uh, what would you do? So I think most people would say, well, uh, <laughs> we, we don't, we don't want to discard the idea of having light as, a, as supplying energy because it works pretty well so far. Why should we simply discard it and replace it with some, something else? The something else might be useful. It's called food. <laughs> but, but would you throw out a mechanism that has been so successful throughout nature or keep it in reserve or keep it as an auxiliary mechanism? So I think you know where I'm, where I'm going with this. And so one, one, one of the first ideas that we were thinking of is the cardiovascular system. So we receive energy all the time and there are many capillaries uh, in our system that are pretty superficial, uh, that receive light. And the question is, well, you know, is it possible that some of this light energy could be used by you and, and me to actually do something in our cardiovascular system. And my first thought about it is no way. Uh, and why did I think no way? Well, I did my PhD on uh, simulating the pressure and flow in the cardiovascular system. And I thought, 
we had all the answers uh, because I, I could easily explain the, the pressure and the flow and all of the different vessels and I, di I didn't need anything light. That's, that's a weird idea, using light to help propel the cardiovascular system. Uh, and then I met a guy, I was visiting my friend at Moscow University um, and my friend said, I want you to meet my, the guy in the next laboratory. And so the guy in the next laboratory was telling me, in translated from the Russian, there's a big problem in the cardiovascular system. And I looked at him with a certain degree of arrogance because I knew what there is to know about the cardiovascular system. I thought, and I said, well, what's, what's the big problem you're talking about? He said, the big problem is this, look, you've got capillaries and and the capillaries uh, in healthy young adults are sometimes down to three or four micrometers in diameter, but the red blood cells that need to pass through them are twice the diameter. They're six or seven micrometers. So there's a big problem there because it looks like Mother Nature made a big mistake, uh, right? Why would you have a tube, <laughs> you know, and the stuff that has to pass through the tube is bigger than the diameter of the tube? But as we know, na Mother Nature doesn't usually make mistakes. So something has got... So he said, he said because of that, in order for the red blood cells to get through, they have to bend. Right, um, so you take something that's the shape of a donut, and it's got to kind of contort uh, in order to make its way through. And he said, if you calculate the resistance of these red blood cells, even if the wall is very well lubricated and smooth, still, he said, it's so high, it's so high that if the heart were completely and fully responsible for doing this, it would need to generate a pressure of something like one million times the pressure that your heart generates. That's high blood pressure. <laughs> uh, so he said, something is wrong. There's got to be another source of energy uh, beyond the heart that does it. And boy, did that stimulate me uh, to, to thinking because I just showed you some experiments where, you know, where you don't need any pressure and you get flow that occurs. You see, and so I thought, hey, maybe this is what's possible. So if you look at, if you look at uh, capillaries, this is, um, this is muscle tissue. Um, uh, I forget the species. Um, and here's one capillary and here's another capillary and another one here and another one here. And you know the red blood cells are supposed to look like this, but in fact, when they're flowing, uh, through a capillary, uh, they're bent, they're squeezed. And this guy up here is having a devil of a time working his way through. You can see uh, it's a small capillary and it's very well, well squeezed in order to get through. So I, you know, I began thinking seriously of the possibility that light energy is involved in driving the flow through the capillaries. And one thing that's interesting is, you know, the heart is beating, and if the heart is responsible, you see pulses of flow, but the flow is very steady, as you can see. So it seems to be not necessarily uh, related to, to the heart. So I was thinking that, um, you know, we know in the case of this tube that radiant energy drives the flow. And so the question arose right away, uh, might radiant energy also help drive blood flow in, in your, your vessels? Um, so we started checking the literature and we found a very interesting re result. Um, we found um, a paper by an Israeli group and they were studying mice. Okay, and they, they were studying uh, uh, blood flow in capillaries using a technique, I don't know if you know about it, it's called optical coherence tomography. It's an optical method where you can uh, image um, um, structures that are even pretty deep inside your body and, and get clear information. Anyway, it's not very important. After their experiment was over, uh, they sacrificed the mouse, and they did it by clamping the aorta, and the mouse dutifully died after about 10 seconds, but they found something peculiar. They found that the blood kept flowing. Now, that's weird because we all know that only the heart is responsible for driving the blood flow, but they're watching and they find that the blood <laughs> keeps, keeps flowing. Lower, lower rate, considerably lower rate, but it keeps flowing and it flows for five minutes, 10 minutes, 20 minutes, 30 minutes, one hour. 
And they repeated the experiment 10 times and they got the same result each time. And they wound up scratching their heads because something is not right. <laughs> if the heart stops, you're dead. And the mouse was surely dead, but the blood, blood kept flowing. Well, it turns out that there are a half dozen some such reports over the past century where people have used different methods, different, different species, and, and a half dozen of them found that the blood keeps flowing after death. It's, uh, it, it's really, uh, so, so we, we thought, you know, maybe there's something to this because there's got to be a mechanism to drive the blood flow. If the heart is not driving it and it flows, something else is going on. So we've done our own experiments and they're just about completed. Um, we're on the 15th version of a manuscript, but um, uh, not because it was rejected, but because I have high standards and my student who's doing the experiment his standards are not quite that high, so we, we keep going back and forth, including on the flight to Paris. Um, and um, so, so he did an experiment using the chick embryo three days old. And at three days, the, the various feedback systems in the embryo are not yet developed, so it's a kind of primitive kind of cardiovascular system. So here's the eggshell, and here's the, the embryo begins to grow above, above the yolk, and you can see the heart is here, and here are some of the vessels that have developed. And he was able to image um, a blood vessel here and a blood vessel here to see if uh, there's post-mortem flow. So the experiment, um, uh, the experimental result is, the main result is shown here. So on this axis is flow, and on this axis is time. So uh, w when he um, uh, injects potassium chloride into the heart to kill the embryo, um, the flow goes way down, but there's still flow. You can see the flow here. And then to test the hypothesis that the mechanism that I just told you about is going on, we decided to add infrared energy. Now, if the mechanism is, is happening there, the flow should increase. Then you can see that the flow does increase to roughly three times the initial value. And when you turn off the infrared here, it goes back down to the uh, baseline roughly. So it appears it appears that the same mechanism uh, that we demonstrated to occur in these tubes is also occurring in capillaries, including presumably your capillaries, right? And, uh, and it's, built, it's built on infrared energy, and, and you know where the infrared energy is coming from. Some of it's coming from the environment, but also your metabolism is generating heat. And so it looks like that heat is not wasted, is not given completely to the environment, but it's actually used, and it's used to drive blood flow in your capillaries. So it appears that um, uh, radiant energy does help to drive blood flow. And um, I, I, I think that it may be similar for plants. We studied onions, and we looked at, it's not published yet, and we looked at flow um, in, in onions, uh, you know, onions have these layers, and you can look at one layer under the microscope, and you can watch the flow. And we found when we added infrared energy, the flow uh, increased. Um, and, and so it, it, you, you think about um, um, uh, another tube that you know better than I, um, the vessels in plants, and I showed you that uh, based on, on this and what Martin Kenny presented that you do have EZs growing uh, inside just pretty much like I showed you for, uh, uh, in other uh, examples. And, um, and if, you, if you arrange the tube vertically, you know, and the question is, has always been, <coughs> uh, how do you get how do you get the water to flow up, especially up 100 meters, you know, to the top of a tree? And it's possible, it's possible that the same mechanism is occurring. And if the same mechanism is occurring, um, it explains perhaps why the flow depends on the season, right? And so when you have warm weather and you have a lot of infrared energy, the system should produce a lot of flow because infrared energy is is um, is what seems to drive this, and as you know, that's the season when uh, when you ha when the the leaves are are filled with water and um, are green leaves, and when the infrared energy begins to diminish uh, in in the autumn, um, then 
the flow begins to, to be reduced, and without flow, um, the leaves uh, then are no, no longer green. And um, it's basically protons that, that do the job. If the mechanism is similar to what we found and similar to, I think, what happens in your, your capillaries, it's the protons that are here that are repelling one another. And so basically, the, I, I mentioned the power of protons because it's the repulsion of these protons that get created from energy that drives a lot of things. And i just give you a, a, a couple of more examples of such. And, and one of them is, is um, um, friction and, and uh, the ability to flow. So what creates friction? So friction is created, by the way, my son is, is the artist of all the, all the stuff. I'm very proud of his, uh, his great art. Um, if you take sandpaper and you take two sheets of sandpaper and you try to, to uh, slide one along the other, you know it's very difficult to slide. And it, the reason is because of so-called asperities that stick out just like, like these do, and so you find it very difficult. But if the surfaces are separated, then it becomes really easy. And uh, you can think of an example of two hydrophilic surfaces, one here and one here. If you didn't have the water in between, these two surfaces, rough surfaces, would be rubbing on each other, just like sandpaper. And the friction is very high. But if you separate them enough, then the friction essentially disappears. And so uh, here's a situation with hydrophilic surfaces, building EZ, building EZ. And remember, the protons come, come out of here. Now, if, if you have not enough protons, just a few, then these protons, um, the like, like, likes mechanism uh, will apply. And these positives will attract the negatives and attract the negatives. And, and so not much happens. But if you have enough protons here, uh, these surfaces are now repelling each other, this and this. Are, are separated by a lot because you have a lot of protons that are repelling each other, pushing these surfaces apart. And then it's a no-brainer to, to slide one on the other. Friction is essentially disappeared. And I think the same thing happens when ice skating. So, <clears throat> so you have ice. I mentioned briefly, uh, briefly that the structure of ice is very similar to the structure of EZ. Uh, I'll uh, mention that again in a, in, a, in a moment, but it has this hexagonal structure. Um, but <coughs> and so, if you want to create ice um, from water. It, it turns out, and I describe this in detail in, in my book, The Fourth Phase of Water, um, if you, if you want to do that, if you melt ice, you get EZ immediately. The structure, remember, is very similar. You get EZ plus protons, and eventually that changes into water. If you want to freeze water, you must go also through this EZ state, and then you get ice. So the EZ is, actually, I'm sorry, I, I don't have time to to describe that in detail, but easy is a necessary intermediate between ice and water. You must go through this stage to get from one, one to the other. And we have evidence for that, uh, much of it uh, uh, published. So when you think of, when you think of the um, ice gate on the ice, the top surface of the ice is actually melted. This was discovered as early as Michael Faraday, um, how many years ago? I don't, I don't remember. And so, if the ice melts into EZ plus protons, the EZ layers are going to be here, and the protons are going to be sitting on top. And if the blade of the ice squeezes these protons together, they want to repel. And so, in fact, the blade of the ice gate never actually touches the ice. It's got this thin layer in between, a layer of protons, and these protons repel each other and keep the blade up above. And so there's essentially no friction. And that's why. Um, um, ice skates, skis, and such, snowboards, um, uh, very little friction uh, when, when you go. And um, there's another, another example uh, is, uh, is the pyramids. So, you know, to create the pyramids, there were quarries of very large stones. And you can imagine it's not so easy to, to take a stone and bring the stone to the place where you're building a pyramid. So what the Egyptians did is they inserted a piece of wood in, into a cracks of these, um, of these large or huge stones. And they, 
<coughs> excuse me, would stick it into a crack and then they'd pour water on it and the sun with the infrared energy would, would um, take that water and, and the wood, create easy water um, and this is sort of thing is studied by my friend Ernst Zürcher, who's here. And, and remember, when you create EZ, you're also creating protons. When you create enough protons, they all repel each other. And the repulsion, I think, is responsible for the cracking uh, that would occur when these wedges of wood were uh, dampened with water and exposed to the sun. So the protons are repelling each other, and, and that's why uh, you can get something that cracks open uh, very easily, because the power of those protons is huge. Um, and, and so, hypothesis, this is the reason or the mechanism underlying the success of the Egyptians in, in breaking stones enough that they could actually be carried to the site of the pyramid. There are other theories, um, including that they had some kind of concrete that they built is another interesting. But anyway, um, the power of protons. So uh, getting, getting back to humans now, um, uh, because we're all here and we all count, <laughs> um, I, I want to say a few words about your health and what's important for your health. And the message is a little different from what you'd read in the standard medical or physiology book. Um, so, so here's a cell. It could be a plant cell. Or it could be one of, one of your cells. And, and the cell is filled with macromolecules. And the surface of the macromolecule is hydrophilic. And therefore, we expect that any water that's in the, in, inside the cell, would at least you have a region here that's easy water with its negative charge around it. Uh, but the cell is actually really crowded. Um, even this grossly underestimates the crowdedness. And so essentially, almost all the water inside the cell is going to be easy water. The protons that come with it repel each other, and they go out. And so the cell remains um, with this negatively charged easy water. And I know it's a, um, a digression, but allow me 30 seconds. Um, do, how many of you know that um, if you stick an electrode inside a cell, that the cell is negatively charged? Is that? Uh, okay, not too many, but it is, and we've done many such measurements, and, and the, standard answer from, the standard answer from the textbook is that it has to do with some aspect of the membrane that's uh, pumping positive charges out and negative charges in. And that argument is a little bit untenable because if you take a situation where either you disrupt the membrane, you get a similar result, or a situation with a gel, which is very similar to the inside of the cell but has no membrane, you get the same electrical potential. So it becomes difficult or untenable to accept the hypothesis that there are some gadgets in the membrane that are responsible for this. I think there's a simpler explanation. We have a paper on that, and that is it's the easy water uh, that's creating the negative charge. Uh, and of course, you need to have enough easy water um, um, to make things function properly. I'll, I'll show in, in a moment that the cell is somehow deficient. And it's known that in pathological cells, you have less negative charge. Uh, cancer cells, for example, instead of minus 60 or minus 70 or minus 80 millivolts inside, it's minus 20 or 15. You see, so, and that's true of other pathological cells too. So the cell is not working properly if it doesn't have enough easy, easy water. But that's a, a, a digression. Now, um, as I said, since the negative charges repel, um, this has potential energy because they all want to get away from each other. <laughs> uh, these negative charges, just like the positive charges, so your cell has electrical energy I inside of it, and that electrical energy is used for the folding of proteins. Uh, I'm not sure how familiar you are, but basically the action inside the cell. These proteins do something for a living. And what do they do for a living? Well, if it's a muscle cell, um, then somehow the folding of the protein is in involved with creating tension and shortening. If it's a nerve cell, the folding of the proteins is necessary for transmitting the information. If it's a secretory cell, the folding of the proteins is necessary for creating the, the secretion. And 
Uh, all of that is dealt with in the book that I showed earlier, uh, the cells, jails, and the en engines of life. So, but each of these proteins is surrounded by easy water. And so the natural state of each of these proteins um, looks something like this. So this is a protein, and it's surrounded by easy water, which is, which is shown here. So what happens is that as the, the, in order to fold, what happens is the easy water disappears, and you get this folding action that gives rise to the, whatever the cell is designed to do. And then when the cell is back to, comes back to its, uh, its quiescent state, this builds, easy water builds up again, and the protein is now extended. So on the right side is, is um, easy, uh, is, is a protein that has no easy water around it or has less easy. It's in a very strange environment. And because it's in a strange environment, it, it doesn't know what to do. And it, therefore, it misfolds. It doesn't fold properly. And it doesn't do its job. So, so your cell containing these proteins is not performing the way it's supposed to perform. It's pathological. Um, so, that's just to give you an idea of the importance of the easy water. And um, <coughs> so it's potential energy from the easy that is driving the work of the cell. It's electrical potential energy. And remember, light builds the easy, which builds negative charge, which supplies that energy. And the energy uh, does the work of folding of the cell. So connecting the dots, what, finally what I get to is that light is responsible for uh, working and folding. It's the light that you absorb that's partially, um, not completely, responsible for driving the work of your cell, just like a plant. So you function in many ways just like the plant. And so if you ask, well, where do you get your energy? Well, obviously, <laughs> you get, you get some of your energy, especially when in France, um, where the food is, <laughs> is very good <laughs> uh, from that. But uh, I would suggest, based on the evidence that I've shown you, that you also get energy from light. And light is absorbed by the water, which builds easy and delivers energy when your cell is doing work. And so the question that, um, that you might um, ask is, should this matter to you? Uh -huh. um, I, and I, the obvious answer is yes, it should matter to you if you want to stay healthy. Water matters, and light also matters. See, and so essentially, like plants. And so um, you ask, uh, well, what builds easy water in your cells? Because if you need easy water in your cells to stay healthy, you want to make sure you have enough of it. If you don't have enough of it, you're sick. You have a pathological kidney or heart or what have you, you see. and so. What you want to do to remain healthy is to build that easy water. And so your question is, what can I do, what can you do to build easy water to help you remain healthy, which you, I think, all want to do? So the first is, of course, hydration, water. You need to drink a, a lot of water. And I think this is well known. Mm. That water will, some of the water will pass out as urine, but some of it will get transformed into easy water. So drinking enough water um, is increasingly realized, recognized to be good for your health. Um, green juicing, uh, I think many of you n know about that. Uh, the natural health people uh, are always talking about it. And I, I've spoken personally to, to um, a few of these people at least, and, and they say the patients come to them, and it doesn't matter what their problem is. The first thing they tell them is to squeeze the, the green juice and drink it. And, and what I, I haven't read too many papers on this subject, but what they tell me is that the patients will come back several months later, and, um, and no matter what their problem was, if they're really adhering to this uh, drinking of uh, squeezed uh, fresh uh, uh, plants, they feel better. They've also lost weight as a byproduct for reasons that are maybe not so clear, but, but they feel better when they've done it. And I think the reason for that is when you squeeze the plants to get the juice out, you're squeezing the water from inside the cells of the plants. And the insides of the cells have easy water. And they're freshly grown plants, so they should have an ample supply of easy water. So you're basically trans transferring the easy water from the plant cell into your cell. And I think that's a reason why it's so effective. 
A third category is substances that have been known for many years, sometimes millennia, especially from the Ayurvedic tradition, to be good for health. <coughs> Uh, a few of them I mentioned here, turmeric, coconut water, uh, ghee, and there are several. And we just published a paper studying uh, a half dozen of, of these, and we started with the hypothesis that uh, the reason, for example, that turmeric is, is good for your health, not just one organ, but all over your body, it doesn't really matter what, what, where the pathology lies. And, and we thought, well, a possibility is that, that this builds easy water. We tried a half dozen of these, and we found in all cases, um, you, you, in the experiment is similar to what I've shown you in the chamber with a, a region of easy water. You add a little bit of turmeric, coconut water, easy expands. And, um, and by contrast, we tried glyphosate, and glyphosate in, in any concentration diminishes the amount of easy water. So a possibility for in the case of glyphosate is that, that uh, the mechanism uh, of, of action could be a simple dehydration, that it, it, it diminishes the amount of easy water that you have in your cells and therefore causes harm because your organs can't function well without uh, uh, a sufficient supply of easy water. It happens at very low concentrations, too. But the agents that are good for health, and recently we tried uh, CBD, cannabidiol, um, builds easy water. Unfortunately, we had to stop the experiment halfway through because, because of legal issues. So in the state of Washington, cannabis is legal, but in the U.S., in general, the federal government is not legal. And at the university, since we get federal money, we can't use uh, cannabis unless we have a special license. It took us two years to get it. We're back to finishing those experiments, but it has a definitely a, a positive effect on easy water. Uh, another one is sunshine. Uh, obviously, you get light from sunshine, and some of us, especially people like myself who live in Seattle, where it's gloomy and gray half the year. We have a lot of clouds in Seattle, um, and some people get depressed. You go out in the sun and you feel good, and you're wondering why, why you feel good. And it's possible that this is part of the mechanism because when the sun shines, there's a component of infrared and certainly, obviously, all other wavelengths of light. And it may be that when we receive these, whether it's our brain or cardiovascular system or what have you, it feels good. And the extreme example of that is a, a sauna. And uh, I don't know if these are popular in France or not, but I certainly know that in Russia and Finland, I've enjoyed them uh, quite a lot. And you know, you go in, and I, I remember one experience of myself. I was at a conference in Finland, and I gave a talk, and at the end of the day, there was um, a party of some sort, and we were drinking and eating, and by 10 or 10.30 in the evening, I just couldn't wait until the um, uh, organizer got up the microphone and announce the bus will be leaving the party and going back to your hotel so you can go to sleep. But instead of that, he said, okay, it's now time for a sauna. <laughs> so, so I remember feeling so tired and just so eager to get back to the hotel. Instead, 20 minutes in the sauna, when I came out, I felt like it was morning and I had just had 10 hours of sleep. It was that dramatic. And I, I, I know it can be, so your question is, well, why? And so I think most of us think, well, it's a psychological effect somehow being in this hot room, either dry or moist. But if you think about it, the heat is associated with infrared energy. So you're getting a huge, a mega dose of infrared energy. And that infrared energy is received by your entire body. And whichever organ happens to be deficient, in that case it was my brain because I was tired, you, you, you build up easy because infrared energy builds easy. And this could be why we feel good when we're in the sauna. Sometimes we will feel we have muscle pains and we come out a half hour later and the muscle pains are gone. So uh, that's another one. Um, and a, a, another way to build easy water is through earthing, uh, connecting yourself to the earth. 
take off your shoes, walk on the grass. Why, why should that be as beneficial as many people have demonstrated it is? And I, I think the reason is it came as a complete surprise to me to find out, but I guess most of you know uh, that the Earth is net negative charge. Uh, I didn't, I, I started my education in electrical engineering. If somebody had told me that the earth was not neutral, you know, I would have said you're crazy, right? But it turns out um, a Russian guy in my laboratory, uh, just as he was departing back for Russia, we we're having a discussion and he's talking about the earth's electrical field. And I said, uh, Andre, you must be talking about the magnetic field. I never heard of an electric field. He said, well, uh, no, there's an electric field, and the field lines point uh, normal or perpendicular to the surface of the Earth. So the, the electric field occurs because there are negative charges in the Earth and positive charges above, and so there's an electrical field between plus and minus. I was extremely skeptical. I, 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 skeptical. I said, Andre, you're crazy. He said, no, you're crazy. In Russia, everybody knows about all this. Even middle school students learn about this. I, I'm afraid that in the US, I'm not sure about France, the education is deficient. I knew nothing about this until 10 years ago, but the evidence is very clear. It's just not well known. So um, if you connect yourself to negative charge, um, remember, easy water has negative charge. Uh, or at least most easy, there are some exceptions, but uh, negative charge. And so if you take off your shoes and your socks and you walk on the grass, this negative charge is sucked up into your body and the negative charge builds easy water. It should because easy water is negative, but we have experiments that demonstrate it. So, so why, do you, why do you feel better when you walk barefoot on the beach or on, on the grass or hug a tree? <coughs> It's because the negative charge gets absorbed uh, into, into your body. So we think that's the reason. So um, this is, a, these are, I mean, to summarize, these are just some mechanisms that you can use. There are others, uh, very straightforward to help. So the question uh, was uh, whether a, a wood fire would do the same. Uh, and I think the answer is, uh, because it's giving off infrared energy and people could feel good next to a wood fire. I think the answer is absolutely, so much so that I'll add this to my list for the next time I, I present. The question was, um, 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 does touch um, have also a, a positive effect because there are many uh, healers, for example, that will touch and, and will effect, uh, will, will, will gain some, some healing. And, uh, and the answer is absolutely yes. Uh, uh, so um, so there, are, there are two things, two things to say about that. Uh, the, the, first, the first is um, um, a healer. Um, uh, I don't know if many of you um, are experienced with, with healers, but I, I, I know quite a few healers, and one of them has made a, a really positive impression. Uh, his name is Bill Bankston, um, and he's actually a sociologist by, by profession, but he's developed uh, a method of healing using his hands. And let me, let me tell you about this, because this is really uh, uh, amazing what he's been able to do. So of course, he works with patients and patients who have cancer, and he's moderately successful. He's worked with mice, and, and here he's able with his hands to uh, achieve a practically 100% cure rate, and it's a real cure, not not just a remission. And the way this occurs, he's done this with various laboratories. So he visits the laboratory, and the laboratory has a cancer model. And it's a, I think it's mice or rat, I think it's a mouse model. And you inject a mammary tumor into the mouse. And after 20 or 25 days, the mouse dies because the tumor grows and squeezes out all of the other organs, so nothing works anymore, and it's 100% lethal. So he goes to a laboratory who are using this technique, and usually the people in the laboratory are studying some drug or anti-cancer anti compound and seeing how effective it is, but he uses his hands. 
So he'll have a, a bunch of mice that are sitting inside the cage and they inject the tumor material and the tumor grows, this big bulge from the side of the, of the mouse. And he'll take a, a cage filled with mice and he puts his hands around the cage and he thinks positive thoughts. Okay, and the positive thoughts, he'll have an image, an image of some positive event in his own life that he can imagine, not something that happened to him, but something that he could imagine. And I guess it's easy to, to imagine the kinds of things that he, he imagines. He has a list of 20 of them. He cycles through, uh, so for example, the first one might, uh, I'm not sure what, maybe he's winning a Nobel Prize because he's recognized for this important work and he's shaking hands with the king uh, of Sweden. And this would be one image. And he has a second and a third and he cycles through them very rapidly during the time he's putting his hands around the cage. As I said, his cure rate um, is very close to 100%. And they're actually cured because the, the tumor regresses and disappears after some time. Usually this tumor is 100% lethal, but his success rate is almost 100%. And once there, the tumor has diminished, if you inject the tumor again, uh, the bulge doesn't develop, so the, the mice are actually immune. And all of this is done with his hands. and and. Um, the question is whether it's the infrared radiation that's coming from his hands that do it. It might be more than that because he needs to cycle through these positive events for for this to work. If he doesn't do that, it doesn't it doesn't work. And so, so that brings you to the next step, which which is information. And I, I don't know how many of you are aware of of um, the idea of information in water. Um, as some of you uh, know the name Jacques Benveniste. Yeah? Yeah, yeah. So, but, and, I'm sorry? Jacques Benveniste. Benveniste. Yeah, so Jacques Benveniste, the late Jacques Benveniste. You, you knew him? No. Water memory. So he lost his career because, because of the, the fight with the editors of Nature. Uh, a long and interesting story about that, but I, I don't want to di digress too much. But I, I should say that right now, Luc Montagnier, maybe you know him, yeah, is, is, uh, has advanced this, this uh, concept and has done very interesting experiments. He comes almost every year to our water conference, uh, which is uh, moving from Bulgaria to Germany next year. Some of you might have interest in, in coming. It's a very exciting kind of uh, uh, conference. But um, So Luke has uh, information that demonstrates that you can transfer information from water. And he does it with DNA. The DNA is sitting in the water. Um, and he can transfer the information from the water that's sitting next to DNA to another water some distance apart, some kind of either infrared or whatever uh, information, and, and he can build new DNA that has the same sequence as the DNA that was sitting next to this water. It's truly amazing, and apparently some groups have confirmed it. And so there's a lot of information from actually quite a few people now increasingly that water can contain memory. So one of the reasons that Jacques Benveniste lost his career is that nobody could imagine that water can store memory. If you think about it, if you think about this kind of water, it's got molecules that are randomly oriented and bouncing around a huge number of times per second. How is it possible that this could store information? However, the easy water is a crystal, and just like a silicon crystal, uh, such uh, a crystal of ordered atoms, in, in, and and this is exactly the kind, the kind of substance that that digital computers use, for example, to store information. Um, and so the same principle can be used. Each atom it, um, is capable. If you think of the oxygens, for example, in the, the, the array of easy water contains oxygens and hydrogens, and each oxygen can have multiple states. In a digital computer, each atom of silicon, um, I mean, essentially, can have either a zero or a one. But in the case of oxygen, it can have um, um, 
uh, states of minus two, uh, uh, minus one, zero, plus one, plus two. So the, theoretically, the amount of information storage in water, in easy water, exceeds the amount of storage in a standard digital memory by um, something like 10 to the ninth. So, so I'm sorry, it's a long answer to, uh, yeah, take care. A long answer to a short question, but, but it, it, looks, it looks as though um, uh, information storage is, is not only possible, but has a great future. And this occurs in our bodies because we're full of easy water. So the, the original question, I'm sorry, I expanded a, a bit on that, but the, the, the um, capacity to store information in our body is huge. Um, and, and healing um, uh, seems to work. It could be infrared energy. It could also be information that contains, is contained in that infrared energy. So um, let me stop here and, and uh, fi finish. And then maybe we have time for a couple of more questions. I'm sorry it took so long. So what I'm suggesting uh, is, is that not that we photosynthesize uh, the way plants do, but but we use light energy. So maybe in some way, uh, in some way, we're similar or more similar to plants than than we think. And uh, and then you know, in terms of practical applications, um, uh, if if what I've talked to you is is not practical, we can get information from from. For, uh, we could get energy uh, from sunlight and water, and you know this is the the principal theme that I've been discussing about negative charge in easy and positive charge in bulk water. And I mentioned to you, you put electrodes in two of them um, like this, and you could get electrical energy out. And in theory, um, you can light a light bulb from water and light. You see and. And, and here's an example that shows that these are little chambers that contain naphion and some electrodes. This is a switch, and beneath here is an LED light and a magnifier. And whoops, and you can see what happens uh, here. Um, uh, turn the switch, light goes on, it's just water. So it means, in theory, it's possible in the future um, to get clean energy, electrical energy, from water and light, you see. And so we have a little startup company that we, we started to, to develop this. And I'll show you the next slide also, um, um, filtration. So <coughs> um, getting drinking water from contaminated water. And the system works like this. Um, so the input <coughs> is water that may contain uh, microbes, bacteria, uh, poisons, junk, what, what have you. And you put it into uh, a, a naphion tube. It doesn't have to be naphion, but something like naphion here. And remember from what I showed you, you have an exclusion zone here and here. And all the junk gets confined to the center. You see, and so we develop something that has a fancy name called differential extractor, and all it is is, is two concentric tubes. So you have a, a narrow tube at the center that collects the junk and disposes of it. And as representative junk, we, we use microspheres just to illustrate. But if you collect the water from the outside, that comes from the exclusion zone, you get relatively clean water. And we've been able to, to separate, to get a separation ratio of 200 to 1 in a single pass using this scheme. And of course, we're trying to develop it into something that's practical, because the amount of water that flows through one of these tubes, the amount of clean water that you get, is enough to satisfy the thirst of a flea. It's trivial. So we're, uh, we've been building it up. We have some technical issues, but we're, we're getting there. And of course, um, perhaps one of the most important um, is to get rid of the salt. And we have some um, experimental evidence that shows that salt is actually excluded from the exclusion zone. And so what you can do with this, if it works, and there are a lot of developmental steps, is you can take ocean water. And you could put it through something like this and get drinking water out of, out of that. And it, the energy for that, of course, you can do it now with reverse osmosis, but the amount of energy that's needed is maybe available in Saudi Arabia, but not, 
not in France, or uh, it's a lot of energy to, uh, to use. The energy here comes from the sun. And the places where it's needed is are places where there's a lot of a lot of sunlight. So I, I come to the finally after uh, uh, to the conclusions, and the, the main sort of general conclusion is that water actually has four phases, not three phases. And we've we all know that uh, we we learn uh, as a as a child that we have ice and water and vapor, um, but. I tried to demonstrate to you, I think from the evidence, that we have a fourth phase, and it's called EZ water. And uh, as I mentioned, the structure of the EZ is very similar to the structure of ice. And we have experimental evidence that shows that when you freeze the water, you cannot go directly from here to here. You must pass through the EZ phase. And also, if you melt the ice, um, you go through EZ. And and then, then to water. So it's a two-step transition. And some people have written to me. I, I, I get a lot of emails, more than I, I can even, even answer. But some people have started to um, think about drinking freshly melted ice. And that contains a lot of easy water. And the reports I get back from some of these people is, it's amazing what it does for health. Yeah, the question was whether if you put water through a vortex, whether it creates easy water. And so I think the answer is yes, but I'm not sure. We've done some experiments, and the experiments appeared to show some easy water, but they were less conclusive than I had hoped. We need to try them over again in a more professional manner. But uh, many people, starting with Victor Schauberger in Austria, the famous naturalist, um, um, contend that if you put water through a vortex, it's living water, which we would call easy water, instead of dead water, which is just standing. So I think the answer is probably yes, but I'm, I'm not sure. It's, I, I don't know enough about that, but yeah, I think so. Some, some crystals uh, can create easy water. So the summary, it looks like that. And, and um, that was not the last slide, but almost. I think the in implications are for this are very broad. Um, and um, um, the, I guess the central piece of information is, is that the water is always absorbing um, uh, radiant energy from the environment. Uh, the chemists and physicists will say that this is in equilibrium with the environment, but I think that's not true. It's always absorbing energy and converting that energy into another kind of energy. Um, and I've given you um, a biological example. Uh, one is, is um, uh, blood flow and maybe the flow in the plant vessels as well, although we haven't studied that as much, but I think the same will occur. Um, in chemistry, so we learn, we learn from books on, on chemistry uh, that uh, how reactions occur. But if what I presented to you is correct, uh, then many of the interpretations will need revision because they never talk about the influence of, of energy coming into the system, uh, of the separation of charge and such. So if all of that is true, then many of the interpretations that are read in, in, in basic chemistry book will need revision. Um, the weather. So we started earlier talking about, about clouds. And you know, uh, we never know when, in Seattle anyway, when we go to work in the morning, should we bring an umbrella? Because 50% chance of rain. So what does 50% mean? <laughs> we don't know. Actually, we don't use umbrellas in Seattle because it's very windy, and so we have jackets with hoods. This is the standard uniform because it rains so, so often. But, but seriously, the issue is the people who predict the weather are not so good at predicting weather. Sometimes they're accurate, and why, why is that? If you listen to the weather forecast on the TV or whatever, they'll tell you uh, about the temperature, and the pressure, and that's all, basically. And they will try using models of previous events, they'll try to predict. And, and they're moderately successful because you know, the re repeating historical patterns is one way to give you information that's moderately accurate. Never, however, do they talk about charge. Right, and you know that clouds are full of charge because you've seen uh, 
indications that look like this. Uh, but there's a lot of information on, on charge in the, the history of people who have been making measurements like this. Clouds and atmosphere are full of charge. Um, but you never hear about this in, in weather forecasting. So my, my opinion is that if you start taking into account the charge in the clouds and in the atmosphere, you'll have a much better chance of understanding weather and understanding clouds and such. So this is coming. Uh, please look for my next book. Oh, by the way, I, I oh, one moment. Uh, <coughs> health. So I tried to uh, present some evidence to you that hydration is really important. And if you can build the easy water inside your body, this is very important for maintaining your health. Uh, in terms of food, you know more about that than, than I know. Um, and, but you also know that the water is critical for, for uh, all of this. And I would like to suggest the new twist is that the water inside the plant is mainly easy water, not uh, ordinary bulk water. Uh, some practical um, influence, uh, practical developments are filtration is one of them, the possibility of desalination and getting electricity from, from water. And before I get to my last slide, I just want to mention to you something um, that has to do not with water in, in particularly, but has to do with science in general. And in my view, um, science is um, limited at the moment. The reason it's limited at the moment is anybody who comes forth with a radical idea, no matter how compelling is the evidence, has a really difficult time because scientists are actually far more conservative than we would like to, 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 to think. And, um, and if, you, if you think about the number of revolutions in science, you know, we move by scientific revolutions, Think of how many you can name that have occurred in the past, say, 30 years. Fundamental, I don't, I don't mean technological revolutions like the iPhone or something. I mean fundamental scientific revolutions. I've asked this to many people, and they kind of look with a strange face. And it's really difficult for them to think of something with the same magnitude of, say, the structure of DNA, which is, I think, 65 years uh, ago, or the splitting of the atom um, of that magnitude. It's really hard to think, and why is that? And I, I think the answer is that um, science has become institutionalized. Um, and because it's institutionalized, if I want to get a grant, which I must have in order to do my work, I send in an application, and it gets reviewed by the people I'm challenging. So it's like the French Revolution, you know, uh, you go to the king and say, I have a few complaints, would you listen to me? Well, you know, thank you very much, <laughs> but, uh, you know, and this is, so this is a problem. Uh, and so we created something called the Institute for Venture Science, and we accept applications uh, from people with revolutionary ideas, and, um, and we attempt to fund them. And our review process is probably more thorough than any, any grant-giving institution anywhere. Uh, we go through many stages of review. And um, so it's a new organization. We selected from among 200 pre-proposals, we checked it, uh, we selected five exciting projects. And these have nothing to do with water. But although it turns out that one or two of them have something to do with water. And right now we're looking for donors who uh, want to, to um, uh, people who have done well and want to do something uh, to give back to, to the people. And so, um, so if you know of anybody who you think might be interested in something like that, please contact me. Uh, one of the projects is the one I mentioned about healing cancer with your hands. Uh, this is one of the ones that we've, we've picked. And so a lot of the stuff that I presented to you is in this book. Uh, it seems to be rather popular. And I'm told that there are some for sale over here. I, I, I don't know about the details. It's a good book. <laughs> OK, anyway, thank you very much.